And Ari obviously going, you absolute disgrace. Look at the shape of you, you disgrace. A Dixie in a romper, st- romper suit doing George Doors, though. Yeah. <laughs> he was just a full romper suit supposed to push the pram. Yeah. Welcome to the Bobby Moore stand. My name is Chris, um, and today we've got a pretty unique show for you. Um, however, before I crack on and provide some context around this, if you could please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Um, it really does help, and Gary and I really do appreciate this as well. So, coming back to the actual show itself, I think you're really going to love this particular one. Um, it's an idea that Gary and I discussed, which was really about interviewing ex-players. And when I say ex-players, I'm not talking about necessarily the usual suspects. What we really want to do is speak to, I guess, players that have been part of the West Ham squads. Maybe that could have been the youth teams, the reserve teams. But ultimately, the prerequisite for us were individuals that have a really unique experience of playing for West Ham. Okay, Um, so without further ado, the player that well, the ex player that I'd like to introduce you to um, signed for West Ham in 1995 um, from an Irish club called Coleraine. Spent three years with the club and left in 1998. He also played with some fantastic players at West Ham as well, the likes of Rio Ferdinand, Slavin Bilic, Julian Dix, um, Steve Lomas, Bishop, Dowie, Hartson. The list is endless. Um, So without further ado, I'd really like to bring in and introduce you to Graham Filson. Hello, Chris. How are you doing, mate? How are you doing? You good? Yeah, thanks for having me on, mate. No, look, thank you for giving your time today. I really, really do appreciate this, right? I think when it comes to unique stories, you've certainly got a really unique story. And when I look back to my kind of childhood of supporting West Ham, I was massively into West Ham, particularly during the mid-90s, which coincided with the time that you obviously joined, joined West Ham United as well. Um, so I do remember your name. I really do. Sadly, I know you didn't quite make that breakthrough to the first team but I'm really interested to understand your story. Um, I guess the kind of first question I've really got for you, Graham, is how does a young Irish kid from Coleraine end up joining a Premier League team like West Ham United? You know, what's the story? How, how did that happen? Yeah. Um, well, I played I played um, for Corey and I, was, I played for their underage teams and I broke into their first team. They're the, they play in the top division in Northern Ireland. They've actually just recently gone become a full-time professional outfit but back then they would have been semi-professional and I'd broken into the first team at about 16 years of age and um, had been playing playing for them when I got identified by a couple of different scouts um, about in 1993 I was 18 I went on trial to Spurs and I did really well on that trial Um, I was meant to go over for a week and ended up staying for six weeks um I just finished my A levels, and I had been doing a summer job, and I decided to obviously have a go at the football. So I quit the summer job. I went over to London. I initially thought it was going to be a week. Ended up spending my entire summer over in London, which gave me a bit of a insight into life in London. Um, uh, Ozzy Ardiles and Steve Perryman were the managers back then, and then just didn't get offered a contract, so returned to back to Korean and continued to play in the in the round the first fringes of the first team that was in and out, obviously being a younger player. And then I went on another trial to Ipswich Town a year later and I did really well on that trial. That was an ongoing situation with going back and forward. My club were reluctant for me to go on too many trials because their belief was that if it was good enough that the scouts could come over here and watch. Now it just transpired that the scout that sent me to Spurs, a fella called Robbie Walker, um, he moved to West Ham and I think he alerted the West Ham to the fact that I've been on the fringes of getting a contract at Spurs and it was it's strange the way football works um, because I'd sort of been out of favour for my home club I hadn't really been playing for a few weeks and I think the manager Kenny Shields saw it as an opportunity to send me over to West Ham to see how I would get on so he sent me over I like, was round about the start of December in 1985 I went over on trial and I played in a reserve game that, that I think arrived maybe on the Monday or Tuesday and the reserve game was on a Wednesday and we're playing Queen's Park Rangers. And it was in the reserve game, um, uh, Bradley Allen and Les Ferdinand were both in the, fir- in the reserve team that night. So obviously I played the game, did really well. We won 2-0. I think I did enough in the training. So I returned back to Northern Ireland and... 
Um, I had been on a placement. I started obviously in between finishing my A levels and going on the first two trials. I started, I started a university degree, and then whilst on the degree, I was on a placement, and I got contacted by our manager Kenny Shields to say, uh, "West Ham, I've contacted us. They've made a bid for you, and we're going to we're going to agree to it. So you have to go over to London, obviously, and discuss terms." Wow, wow. I mean, that's an interesting story because the fact that you came up against what was two really established strikers, and you were playing in defence, right? You were playing at centre back. Yeah, centre half, yeah. So you're playing at centre back against Les Ferdinand and Bradley Allen in a trial match. Uh, it's, it's, when I look back now, you know, especially obviously being 20 years of age and, you know, obviously playing on a part time capacity. And then yeah. when you go out for those trial games and you don't really initially know who's playing in the games, because, as you know, there was the, the reserve team list can change fairly frequently if a player needs more game time or if a player's injured and needs, you know, need, needs to get a bit, a bit more time or somebody could, you know, Many a time, a first team player could be pulled out maybe because there's somebody at training has had an injury and they need to replace him into the squad. So, whenever the players run out, you don't really have an idea. But I knew fairly quickly, having a good yeah. knowledge of English football, who uh, who the two players that were playing up front were. So obviously, I needed to be on my game that night, and thankfully, I did fairly well. And I think on the, on the back of that and that experience, you know, um, I was offered a contract. How did you find that, though? I mean, that must have been quite an eye-opener to come up against Les Ferdinand because at that particular time, QPR, he would have been coming into his peak, right? I mean, this is just yeah. before we joined Newcastle. So he was, a, he was a formidable striker at that particular time. I mean, when you see him running out and you're lining up against Les, you're coming up against Les Ferdinand, what, what, what are you thinking? I mean, you're like, Christ almighty, how am I going to do this? Well, it'd be very easy to be awestruck because obviously... Whenever you're young, you watch you watch the football and you watch yeah. the Premier League, and you get to know all the players. My two boys at the moment, they're they're the same. They're nine and there's eleven and nine, and they they could tell you everything everything about the players and the teams. And obviously, I knew who these players were, but the way I looked at it was I had I had experiences of the previous two trials, so I kind of had an idea. And in the Ipswich Town trial, I'd played against Alan Smith in a reserve okay. game, who obviously was a top top striker for Arsenal, and I done yeah. well against him. So. I, I wouldn't say I was in awe of him. Obviously, I knew I knew the caliber of player, and I knew that I was going to have to be the playing at the top of my game. But I suppose it inspired me a wee bit. You know, I didn't want to I didn't want to play and look out of place. I wanted to at least give myself an opportunity. And and trial situations, you know, it's it, it's a one off. You just have to, you know, get leave it all on the pitch and hope that with a bit of luck, you'll things will work out for you. And I, you know, I, there was a bit of luck that night that I had a fairly good game and I did really well. And, and obviously, that that then manif manifested in there. I moved to West Ham, which was for me was was an exciting time in my life. I bet, I bet. What was the score of that game out of interest, Graham? Uh, I think we won two 0 Oh wow, fantastic! Yeah. So a clean sheet against Ferdinand and Bradley <laughs> Allen on your on your debut yeah. in the reserve match. Fantastic. Uh, although, although to be fair, I think probably uh, I think probably he probably Ferdinand probably had his eye in Saturday's game. You know, he's probably thinking to himself, I'm "Not going to do too much here." It's not as if he was going to have to prove himself to get on the Saturday's team, you know. So he maybe. He maybe took it easy on me. Well, that's that's maybe the way I look at it. But in a way, mm. we got the result and it worked out. It worked out for me. So okay, brilliant. You get you get obviously word from your manager at the time that West Ham want to sign you. What's going through your head at that particular moment? Because with respect, Colrain to West Ham, that is a significant leap in terms of size, stature of club, quality of player, quality of team, I and mean, everything about it. Right, is completely yeah. different. What's going through your head at that particular moment? Well, I suppose like like anybody who's who's a football a football fan, you know, whenever we're whenever we're young, we all have aspirations of being a professional footballer. I think it's you know it's the first thing you think about. You know, when you're young, what would you like to be? I remember being asked at school, what what would you like to be when you grow up, or what would you like to be? And I and I, I remember telling them a professional footballer. And I remember early early in my childhood and my school days, it I would have got a snigger because obviously the opportunity and the chances of becoming a professional footballer are fairly slim. You know, so it's always something you you would love to achieve, but you know that percentages are against you. It's it's a very difficult um, occupation to break into. You know, but yeah. as I say, for for, for the to get that opportunity, there's a lot of there's a lot of excitement. Um, I remember that um, at, at the age of twenty, sometimes you think to yourself that maybe it's passed you by. You know, whenever you're young, playing with other players. You know, a lot of players have been affiliated to clubs, you know, whenever teams that I played for under age, fifth, under 13, under 14, under 15. There's been players that I've played with who've all been affiliated to clubs. I've been over in trials, I've, I've signed schoolboy forms, 
you know, I may have been going back and forth to England for years, but then maybe it doesn't transpire in their professional contract. So I did it, kind of did it the roundabout route. I sort of plied my trade in the lower leagues or the up, well, sorry, not lower leagues, but the higher leagues in Northern Ireland. Um, yeah. And and I've gone over later, which for me ha- had a big advantage. And I, I didn't have to do an apprenticeship that way. I was going over as a professional. It gave me a wee bit of a, a stable <laughs> income for a couple of years where I could have a right rattle. I had the university degree in the background, which I deferred on. And I finished when I came back home at the end of my three years. So it more or less sort of I had a, an informal agreement with my mum that um that if I got my qualifications, that I could have a rattle at the football because then I had something to fall back on. And it's something that I'm my two boys play football as well. And it's something I've told them that get your school work done first, do well at your school, and then you can have a rattle at the football and if it works out then or if it doesn't work out, you've got something to fall back on, you know. So but as I say, the, the, I remember the excitement that that Christmas in nineteen ninety five, you know, because as I say, I didn't expect it. Um, it sort of came out of the blue, the fact that I went over on trial when I was out of favour, which is really bizarre because normally you would go thinking, you know, you're playing at the top of your game. Yeah. But, uh, you know, but but it's just it's just strange the way sometimes things just happen for a reason. And equally, the fact that my two uncles and my grandfather were big West Ham fans as well oh, was obviously, yeah. for them, it was a massive excitement, you know. Um, and, and, you know, the excitement around the family and the excitement among my friends and, I've no doubt there was a wee bit of envy too among players that I played with. You know, everybody likes to think they're, you know, people would challenge and say, well, I was a better player than him, but maybe I was just the first one that got the, the opportunity to do it, you know, and for that I'm thankful. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible. So December of 95, you joined West Ham United. Um, some big players playing for West Ham at that particular time. I remember it clearly because I was going to games week in, week out. That was, for me, the period of my life when... And I still am obsessed by West Ham, but I was really obsessed. A bit like my son is now, in fairness. Um, what was the leap in quality like for you? I mean, bearing in mind you're coming from, again, from Colerain, you're joining West Ham United, and you're effectively playing with established yeah. Premier League players, right? You know, how did you how did you adapt to that, 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 that quality of player? Yeah, we have to adapt fairly quickly. The thing is, where I said it was an advantage for me to go over, I always say, as a professional financially, I was disadvantaged in the fact that the younger players are coached the whole way through the system. So they're they're maybe affiliated with West Ham from the age of nine or ten or eleven. Yeah. They're 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 working through those underage groups the whole way through, hoping with the opportunity to go through into the reserve team, into the youth team first, into the reserve team, into the first team. So they they've been coached for that purpose. Whereas mm-hmm. when you're coming from a part time environment, you have to play catch up really quickly because you're coming with a different skill set, a different level of training. Um, you know, you're training part time. You're training Tuesday to Thursday night, and you're playing on a Saturday. Yeah. Whereas in, at West Ham, you're training, you know, four days a week, playing a reserve team game, and possibly training again on a Sunday. So, you know, when I first came, the the thing that I was fortunate about was that I was fairly fit. I was a fairly aggressive twenty year old. Um, I was a good communicator. And I, I I didn't shirk challenges. I was I, I'm a pretty I was a pretty aggressive sort of gritty player. So I would have seen the you know the challenges stepping up as a as something that I would love to get my teeth into. Um, it, it wouldn't take away from the fact that a lot of the players technically would have been a lot better than me. But sometimes you can gain a bit more by being an aggressive player and being somebody who's wholehearted and committed. And you know if somebody's having an off day and you're having a sort of a good a good day, you can sort of balance it up. But I just remember when I first came, I just um, the, the the levels of the first team were frightening, you know. Yeah. But, but I have to be to be fair to them. You couldn't have went into a nicer bunch of lads, proper yeah. characters, you know. And yeah. I've hold great memories of that era because of the fact that we had so many characters. And me personally, I believe that the players back then were more in touch with the West Ham support. Yeah, they knew what it was like to play for West Ham. Money was still good. But I think mm. now money is really <laughs> taken over. The, has really taken over the sport. Back then, you'd proper, you proper boys who knew knew the East End, knew at West Ham. You know your Tony Cottage, your Alvin Martins, who, who knew your Steve Potts, who who had been there for a long time, knew what West Ham was about, yeah. and really, really got, really got the supporters. You know. Yeah, I mean, I I used to go down to the training ground quite frequently and and skip school. I'd go down to Chadwell Heath and, you know, quite frequently, Harry would let you go into, you know, the, the, the canteen area. You could have a cup of tea and you're sitting around players and the players were just, they're just human beings. They're just people you can chat to. There's no, you know, like superstars as such as there are nowadays. You know, they wouldn't necessarily perceived as, 
you know, being like a, a super yeah. or uber famous individual is very, very different from my experiences. And and I can even remember as a kid turning up at the training ground and Peter Shilton was there at the time. And he asked me and a, a friend of mine, can you come and train with us? Mm. And so there he was, he was practicing his goal kicks and it was, it was incredible. It was such yeah. a great experience. And I think that kind of, um, you know, attachment that players have with the fans and the fans have with the players it's so different now because they're in a whole different world. Obviously, financially, it's a whole different ball game as well. But touching on finances, Graham, right? So I understand you signed from Coleraine for thirty thousand okay? pounds. Yes, there were stip stipulations, stipulations of the contract. So there was, so it was a initial down payment of thirty thousand, and I think it was if I made made any first team appearances, it was another tr trunk of money. If I made any international appearances, it was another trunk of money. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was all the stipulations, but I think Harry was glad I didn't make any first team or, or any international appearances. So it was a basic 30 grand, you know. So, yeah, yeah. Well, do you know what? I'm, I'm interested, and if you don't mind me asking, right? We talk about salaries of players nowadays, but as a, as a young kid joining West Ham, 20 years of age, if you don't mind me asking, Graham, what kind of salary, what kind of package were you on back then? Yeah, I remember uh, of a funny story. I remember going in whenever I Whenever I um I was brought over, so obviously I was brought over. He brought my mum, my dad, and my sister over. Picked us up from the airport from Belfast, three on the London, and they brought us across to the ground. So, um, I went up to have negotiations um with Harry and Peter Story, who was a managing director then. So I remember I was taken into the boardroom. My my mum and my sister stayed outside. My dad came in, so he was kind of my informal agent back. Then. So he, was, he wasn't really an agent because he had absolutely no we had no know how of what they asked for. So we were coming in the room and I remember we were discussing on the plane, you know, wonder what I'll get offered here. You know, you think to yourself, right, I'm coming over as a young pro, you know, I'm not going to be on mega, mega money. Obviously, I'm going to be living, living in London. It's going to have to be enough for me to survive on. Um, but obviously, I want the opportunity to, to give it a go. So I'm not I'm not going to be pushing for any big wages. So I just remember my dad went in and we thought to ourselves, well, we have to do a bit of negotiating. So we went into the room and they sat me down and Harry said, he said, right, we're going to offer you, we're going to offer you 30,000 pounds to sign as okay. a signing off fee, right? And then we're going to offer you 500 pounds a week. Okay. So I remember, I, I glanced to the side of my dad and my dad had worked in a, in a, in a, in a DuPont, which was a big uh, Kevlar company, manufacturing Kevlar. Okay. And I knew from his face, obviously I was 20, so I had no real knowledge. I hadn't worked. I'd only worked part-time. And I yeah. looked over, kind of glanced over to him, and my dad was kind of shaking his head as if to say, yeah, we'll take, we'll, I think we'll take that. You yeah, know? yeah. Was just, so there was no negotiation on your part. You didn't even say, oh, you no, didn't try no, to No, no, no. Can I get another 100? Or, no, so I just remember, so it's £30,500 a week. And he said, you'd be subject to all the bonuses that come yeah. with the appearances for the first time. And the reserve team had small bonuses, but they were only like very insignificant. They wouldn't be worth. But the first team bonuses were pretty were, were pretty meaty. Okay. So I just remember I just remember coming out of the room then and went, yep, signed, signed the forms. And mm. then they took me down the pitch. But as I went back out of the room, I remember remember my mum was sitting on my sister and my dad looked at my mum and he said, He's earning more than I did. <laughs> working, working 25 years in, in J Pond. So we did. Mom says very happy days. It's going obviously he's got a decent offer there. So, uh, you know, so that was a three year contract, was it, Graham? Right? Yeah, three year contract. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, big money, right? Thirty grand signing on fee when you're twenty yeah. years of age. I think that in itself would have been a bit of an eye opener, right? I, mean, I bet you. That's yeah. Grand. Well, cer certainly an Irish league level. Um, back then, that would be like that would be internally. You wouldn't get players moving within the clubs within the Irish league for that mm. money. You know. Yeah. So obviously, you know. For the for the move to sort of come out of the blue, it just really it, it happened in this space of about it must have been about a two week period. So it kind of came completely out of the blue and threw everybody by surprise because nobody yeah. anticipated it happening, you know. But um, I know Corey invested the money well. They bought a player with it that they were after for a period of time, and that player helped them get promotion as well. So, um, so it worked well for all parties. You know, I got yeah. well looked after. Um, and then it was January. It was sort of January time was me to start my adventure. Yeah, yeah. So, how did you adjust? Because that's that, that must be quite a big shift in terms of your life from a twenty-year-old young guy, young man, moving to London. Um, you know, the big bright lights of London. Yeah. What was that like for you? Where Where did you live? I mean, I presume you're uh, in. Somewhere. Yeah. Well, it was funny too. The first the first three months, I was in the Swallow Hotel in Waltham Abbey. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, synonymous status, was, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. At that time, I signed the same day as Slavin Bailey. So Slavin, okay. Slavin was in the hotel the same time as me. Yeah. Michael Hughes, who was Northern Irish, yeah. had just moved from a French club and was in and around, had come on loan, I think, initially, and he was staying in, in there with his French wife. Um, so there was a few players around. Now, it was difficult because I wasn't driving, so you relied. You get picked up for training and brought back. Mm-hmm. But I, I struck up a really a really nice friendship with Slavin Bilic mm-hmm. whenever he first came in. There was myself and another young pro called Chris Coyne, who went on to have a good career with Luton. Australian, yeah. Australian, yeah. Australian, Australian international, yeah. yeah. So me, and Chris, me and Chris were in there around the same time. He was in the youth team, I was in the reserve, but we both signed, signed around the same period. So for the first couple of months, myself and him were in the swallow. So that was an unbelievable experience because, as you well know, a lot of the f- travelling football teams, when they're playing West Ham, used to stay in the swallow. Yeah. So you used to see them, you used to see all the other, you know, your Man United's and your and your Liverpool's all coming and staying in the swallow the night before the game. So you'd be down having your, you know, and the thing was, the food was all free. So you you, you had, you were allowed to run up really, but as long as it wasn't alcohol, all alcohol, as long as it was food. So I was having steak dinners every night and I had I had relatives that were over in London and they were coming up to meet me just in the, the hotel for a dinner. I would say, more of a buy your dinner. And like, I was going yeah. to put that on my tab and put that in my bowl. And I was yeah. like, running up this bowl left, right and centre, you know. Yeah. And I think I was told one time that, right, not you're having too many steak dinners. So cut it back, don't be eating steak dinners every night, you know. Yeah. Did you, did you um, again, I know we've kind of touched upon this already, but when you joined West Ham again, there would be a difference in terms of the quality of player that you were training and playing yeah. with concurring to West Ham. Did you feel out of place at all? Or did you feel pretty comfortable in that environment in terms um, of your ability? I, I, I wouldn't say I felt out of place. I wouldn't say I felt comfortable either. There's always yeah. a, you're going to the unknown. It's like, it's like moving, I'm sure like Premier League players moving from clubs. You've got a confidence in your own ability, but you're moving into a new environment. You're meeting new people. You don't know how you're going to adjust. You don't know what the team's going to be like. You don't know if people are going to be friendly, you know, and you don't bond with everybody. You know, whenever you come to a club, you generally gravitate. Now, I was fortunate um, whenever I moved. the We were in a swallow the first couple of months, and then myself and Chris Coyne both thought, look, we're too far out here. If we were in somewhere closer to, close, closer to the East End, you know, to the outskirts of the East End, the, as I called it, the end of the district line, we could rattle about, we could go out, you know, we could do much, much more. So, we spoke to the club and the club, one of the one of the uh, staff members connected to the club had a, a an apartment in Upminster up near the train station at the top end, which was handy for getting into the, obviously jumping the district line and we'd be able to get in and out to the, the Upton Park as well. So um, we, we, we ended up getting this apartment and it turned out there was four of us in the apartment. There was a, there's a, a Finnish fella called Miko Niemannen who was in the youth team. Okay. There was Chris Coyne and then there was, there was Paul Mitchell he okay, was in yeah. the first team squad. Yeah. He had sort of signed from Bournemouth. Obviously, Harry had brought him with, with him. And mm. the four of us were in the digs. So, effectively, there was three bedrooms. There was a dining room and there was a, a kitchen area. So, the dining room area had a hatch. So, I ended up, ended up being my bedroom. So, I had the bedroom with a hatch door that opened up under the kitchen. So, you could look through under the kitchen, you know. Yeah. So, but it was it was really, really nice nice area to, to be. Um, as I say, it was handy for... Horn Church was handy for Romford, and then you could jump on the train, district line, and batter in the, the centre of London if you wanted. Yeah. So it was a, as I say, it, it was, it was London, but the outskirts of London. I suppose people say up oh, there's the outskirts of London. You know, you're not, yeah. you're not, you're not right in the East End, as in, in it, in it, uh, East Ham or West Ham, and in that area. Yeah. But um, but it was still, it was still, you know, a daunting experience, sort of going to London. But you know, it, having other players in the digs with you. You know, helps you helps you settle because we all get homesick and we all sort of at that age we're all you know all worry about you know being away from home. But as I say, it's a it's a it's a profession, and if you want to succeed at football, you have to be capable of moving about because it's something that happens in football, like you know. Yeah, yeah, no, I can imagine, but I'd also imagine that you would have had some good nights out as well with those guys, right? Uh, I mean, what's uh, it like being a what's it like being a young West Ham pro? Um, single. I'm 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 assuming a single. Yes. West- yeah. Pro, okay. Yeah. You've got the lure of the big lights, all that kind of good stuff. You must have had some good nights out, right? Yeah, yeah, we definitely did. We definitely had a few. We had Romford on a few occasions and a few nightclubs. <laughs> and I'll be honest, I, I would have been a fairly shy I, I, Irish lad. You know, would have been sort of football would have been first and foremost, and obviously being thrown in the, in the 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 Essex uh, nightclub scene at the age of twenty, fairly yeah. opened a few eyes, and then 
you know, I always remember laughing when, whenever you first, you know, a lot of the all younger players were going out, your real Ferdinands and all were starting to go out and they used to always meet up in a big group and then you would have come out and joined them and then they would have explained who you were and then, then to be fair, you had no problem then getting, obviously, girl, girls interested as well when you were the, the club, you were a professional at West Ham United. Yeah, so, the same, it was, the um, gigs, yeah. yeah, but it was like a, a brave experience, as I say, <laughs> There's no comparison between even our big cities, Belfast. Like there's no comparison between Belfast and and uh, London. Um, yeah. we have good good nightlife in Belfast, but the nightlife in London was was phenomenal. You know, I, I I can imagine. I can imagine. And you know, again, when I was a kid and going out, I used to see a lot of the players going out and having a great time, swamped with women. You know, you only had to say you played for West Ham and they recognise you. And I can imagine the attention you guys would have got, right? It's kind of quite, kind of annoying when you're a single guy and you're not a West Ham player and you're seeing all these girls, all these birds, uh, and yeah. players, like, ah, get. <laughs> especially, especially if you've been spending your your previous hour trying to chat some girl up and then some <laughs> some group of fellas come wandering in and the next thing she's over in among the group of West Ham players, yeah. you know. So, but uh, yeah. to be fair, but I am. But to be fair, like in that in the East End area where we would have socialised, you know, there was a big, big, big love for West Ham. And yeah. the, the, the supporters were bringing like anytime you went out and they found out you're a West Ham fan, you know, mm-hmm. they were they would love they love to talk about the club and the lo- the history of the club and how much it meant to them, you know. So you like if you're like and as I say that it's that was always for me that my biggest my best, biggest experience of being at West Ham was the fact that the tradition of them the academy and the club being such a good football side and mm-hmm. you know, being known for playing good football and you know, bringing players through and not being the biggest club in the world, but on their day, being able to hold their own and having a real proud East End tradition and wanting to, you know, work hard and make the people of that area proud of them, you know. Yeah, I mean, proper working class football club. It always has yeah. been, you know. And I think the fans are no different nowadays. I think maybe the younger generation have different expectations on the club. But if you speak to a lot of the fans that have been supporting West Ham for, a, you know, a good 30, 40, 50 years, I think um, for us, it's really about getting people that are going to, really work their socks off right you really work hard for the club people that you could rely on you know that when they put that shirt on they're going to give it a hundred percent every single time and it means a lot right i mean that's the thing with west ham fans we don't ask for much we don't i mean let's face it we've not had a great deal of success over the last 40 years certainly since i was born i think the year i was born was the last time we actually won a cup which was the fa cup aside from obviously you know a year and a bit ago when we won the europe the european conference uh, mm-hmm. the league. So we don't ask for much but what we do ask is hard work, endeavour, right? And, yeah, I mean, you know all about that, obviously, having been at West Ham. I'm sure that was ingrained into you when you joined the club as well. Yeah, well, as I say, my my, my background in West Ham, through my uncles and my grandfather when I was growing up, was West Ham were always synonymous with playing good football. They were a good football side. They, they you know, you had your, your, your sort of player who, who cared and play, but wanted to play the game the right way. You know, they got it down. Even in those really muddy pitches in the seventies and eighties, they got the ball down and they played football. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, they didn't have the pitches that they play on now, but they were always renowned for that. They would never change their philosophy. They were always it was always a football philosophy. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and as I say, that that was all I, when I was growing up. I always knew that about West Ham that when you went there, you were going to a, pro, like a proper football club. It's a proper football club. Yeah, yeah, no, hundred percent. And looking back to that time that you joined West Ham, so. As we all know, I mean, West Ham have a have a knack, right, of developing youth talent. We always have done. So when you joined, I mean, you've mentioned a few of the names again, like what, Rio, Frank, and so on. Without kind of necessarily stating the obvious here, but who really stood out for you? You know, when you looked at that, that team at that particular time, when you look at the young talent coming through, the senior talent, who were the players where you almost like, wow, they've, they're exceptional? Well, certainly on the underage, from the underage group, um, Rio Ferdinand, Clearly, was a talented footballer. Mm. Um, he would have came across as very easy going, casual. But whenever, any time he stepped up, I would have trained him and with the first team squad. So any time he he was brought up in the first team squad, you could tell he was a natural. That, that he certainly wasn't phased by training with him. He he, would, he he had good feet. He was athletic. Um, you know, he, he was a competitor to a certain extent as well. So he was yeah. definitely one that stood out. They had. Michael Carrick coming through the youth team was heavily was heavily talked about. Um, he was a player with really, really good ability. You know, very, very good passer of the ball. You know, an old head and young shoulders. And obviously, he had an absolute stellar career. 
in, in, in the clubs in the years afterwards after they left West Ham and mm. probably probably the one the one that worked the hardest when I was there in the underage group would have been Frank Lampard. Okay. Um, right. like f- Frank was t- clearly a talented footballer, but his desire, his commitment in regards to doing extra training was phenomenal. You know, most of your young pros would have been finishing training that day and heading off. You know, you headed back into your your digs, or you went out, you played snooker or pool, you went to the pub for a pint maybe, or you, you went to the bookies, as a lot of young people did back then as well. But he would have stayed on and trained and done sprints. I remember Frank Lampard Sr. taking him from, for sprints and stuff. And I remember them running with a, running spikes on and a parachute on to get extra mm-hmm. speed. And obviously, from, from a goal scoring perspective, like he's like up there in the top, and those are the top five, maybe top 10 players in the Premier League, ever, goal scoring from midfield. So yeah. for, for me, he, he certainly he certainly epitomised a hard-working graft. Ferdinand and Carrick, you could tell, were talented footballers, but Frank Lampard worked harder, probably, to achieve that level. I think yeah. the other two were, were naturally gifted, and I think Frank, although Frank, again, is a, is a gifted footballer, but I just remember his commitment being phenomenal. I think, I think a lot of fans at that particular time, Graham, were, I don't think we're overly kind to Frank, because I think once he broke into the team, there was always that question around nepotism, right? Because his old man was obviously assistant manager working closely with Harry, of course, who was his uncle. I suppose a lot of fans would be looking at objectively thinking he's only getting into that team because of who he knows and who he's connected with. But I think obviously over time, he proved that he was obviously an exceptional player. I mean, what was he like? I mean, did, did he feel that? Because obviously you would have been in around Frank when you were playing yeah, for him. Yeah. I mean, how, how did he feel? What was his connection like with West Ham and the fans? I mean, how did you know? Did that affect him? Do you think you know that particular time? Um, I would I would say it probably drove him on as as a as a person. He was a yeah. lovely fella, um, very friendly. Him and Chris Coyne would have been quite friendly. Mm. Um, they would have come over to our to our digs and upminster quite a bit. Yeah, uh, and it's ironic now because he's obviously he's obviously married to a girl from Northern Ireland, and he's he's been over here quite a few times. And a couple of close friends of mine are actually very close friends of his, although we've never run into each other. Yeah. But they're close, close associates. But he, Fra- Frank was always came across as a really, really down to earth fella. Um, yeah. I, I, I've no doubt he saw the criticism as a motivator. Um, obviously, see, Frank Lampard Senior was a West Ham legend, um, and he wanted the he wanted the um, follow in his dad's footsteps, and he mm. wanted to play for West Ham too. Um, and I do yes. I suppose there was. I, I do remember at that time that there was the undercurrent. I remember the interview that happened in the press press room where he, he was questioned about why is Frank in and around the, the squad. And I remember how he ended up standing up for him. You yeah. know, but obviously that 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 uh, that press conference is, hasn't aged too well for the fellow asking the questions. It's aged well for Frank Lampard because <laughs> he had an absolutely phenomenal Premier League career. And yeah, obviously the, 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 the initial the initial um, identification of his talents was spot on. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it was. I've, I've seen that interview back and I think they did that over in, a, if memory serves me right, in Collier Row. I think it was at the old um, bowling alley. I forget what they called it now. It was City Limits, I think, at the time. But yeah. they did you there. And I remember the guy was saying, well, I think it was Scott It was Scott Cannon, wasn't it? Right? Scott Cannon, mate. Scott was in the reserves. He was yeah. in the reserves of me at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he obviously proved himself and, you know, the rest is history. But was there any other players at West Ham that actually surprised you that perhaps you thought, you know what, don't really rate them? But they ended up having a really good career. Um, I'm trying to think coming through. The, the, you see, I suppose when you look back, the, the the better known players are the ones you hear more of. Um, obviously, um, Joe Cole was in the youth team around that time as well. He was yeah. starting to emerge in the fringes, and I remember being a real buzz. But there was a real expectation that he was going to going to be something special. I yeah. remember it being discussed in the in the first team change rooms. About about this young lad that was coming through in the youth team that was an absolute talent. Um, I suppose I'm trying to think of my Chris Coyne. To be fair to him, had a fairly good career. Played for Luton and did really well. Got a couple of promotions. I'm trying to think of players that that I didn't think would do well. There's nobody I can really really think of that that you know a lot of the players. I suppose a lot of the players in that reserve team I I was in. You know they were changing on it. Whereas, whereas I was on a, maybe a three-year contract, there was a lot of players there maybe on a year-to-year, those young pros. Hmm. So you maybe they were there for one year and then the next year they were gone. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because they've maybe come through the youth team and they've maybe been given a one-year or two-year professional deal and then, you know, so 
I can't, I can't think of any that would have stood out now that wouldn't have that they thought no he shouldn't be playing at this level you know yeah. um well, let's flip the question around then graham in that case are there any players that you thought would have an exceptional career that really stood out you know maybe coming from the youth team the reserve teams you know whilst you're with west ham that, uh, didn't. that didn't who sorry that didn't have a career or did yeah 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 yeah, yeah exactly yeah that, that didn't pick players that you thought looked really good had all the talent in the world, but for one reason or another, didn't quite make the grade. Um, there was quite a few of the youth team players that were coming through at that time. Players like Joe Keith. Yeah. There was a few. There was there was him. There was um, I'm trying to think who else was coming through at that at that young stage that were talented. Um. Uh, who else? I'm players around that time, and I'm, I'm assuming you're probably thinking maybe players like Lee Hodges, Joe Keith. Lee, um, funny, Lee Hodges was the name that I was just trying to remember there. Okay, Lee, yeah, Lee yeah. Hodges was a fairly, fairly well thought of striker, and he had gone on out and loan a couple of times while I was yeah. there. I'd gone to Exeter, and he'd done fairly well. Um, yeah. And again, um, I'm not sure what happened with him. I'm sure he played lower, lower level and down the leagues and stuff like that. There, yeah, but he was another one. Um, yeah. The reserve team, the reserve team is funny because you have a lot of players. Because obviously the first team squad was quite big. We had a we had a lot of sort of he heavy hitters with regards to experience. You know, you mentioned your Peter Shelton's. Like I yeah. played, play, I played with Peter Shelton. I played with um, Chris White, who was the lead centre half. Yeah, I remember. I remember West Ham. He played yeah. reserves. Obviously, Les, the late Les Sealy, who was a bit of a character, played in the reserves. Um, you then had a lot of other players who were. Um, coming into the country, um, I remember Slavin had a couple of early reserve games at the start. Um, mm. We had uh, Danny, who came oh. in. Uh, Paolo Fritri and Ellie Dumitrescu played a few reserve. So it was always funny on the on the Wednesday training or Wednesday match day for the reserves to see who was actually what first team squad were coming mm. into the reserves. You know, because you, it could have been it could have been four or five every week. You know. I'm interested to to understand it because obviously we've always obviously clarified that you didn't get into the first team, you know, the actual first eleven for no. the Premier League. I, mean, I, was a squad, I was number twenty six, so I was a first team squad member, but obviously yeah. I was on the fringes of the first team squad. Yeah, but with regards to players that you did play with, because you clearly did that in the reserves. I mean, talk to me about the lineups that you were playing with, okay? Because I'm sure everyone's probably interested in understanding who Graham Filson was playing with yeah. at West Ham at that particular time in competitive reserve team matches. I mean, talk to me about the lineups you, you, you know, you. Yeah, were... well, there were, there were, there were, as I say, there was a lot of first team players, and then you're really talented youth team players were coming in, so you had a bit of a mix between the the experience and then the raw. So, you know, you're talking about the names we mentioned before there. I played with Rio Ferdinand. I played with Frank Cott Lampard. I played with Michael Carrick. Um, I played with, again, Trialis that came in. As I said, I mentioned uh, Chris White. I played with Shelton. I played with Les Seeley. Um, and then I'm talking about the thick of the Irish lads. Keith Rowland. Yeah, yeah. played the odd reserve game, who I would have been very, very friendly with during my time at West Ham. Yeah. Mm. Um, People like Michael Hughes, Steve Lomas, boys that were, you know, they, all, they would only have played the odd game, to be fair to them, um, maybe coming back from an injury or to get half an hour under their belt. But yeah. it was a, it was really crazy with some of the some of the teams. You know, I have some are on, on a box there in the back uh, back cupboard there. I've got a list of the old programmes which used to be printed out in the sheet of paper where you had the list of names. Oh, and yeah, it's, yeah. it's interesting now when you look back, even the teams you're playing against and you recognise names and teams that you played against. You went, I didn't even realise I played against them. And they've gone on to have really stellar pre uh, Premier League careers. Yeah, so that, that's actually quite funny when you don't realise. I didn't realise he was on that team, you know. So, well, one thing I'm really interested in, and I'm sure a lot of the um, viewers will be interested in this as well, Graham, is stories. Okay, um, the '90s, I'm sure, would have been synonymous with, and we all know it was synonymous with some fantastic characters. You know, I think, you know, drinking was probably part and parcel of being a, a footballer back then as well, a lot more so than it is now when, you know, obviously in terms of fitness and um, everything else is is obviously, you know, extremely serious nowadays. But back then, I know you guys like to enjoy yourselves a little bit. So um, I've read some things about you before. I know you've, you've stories about you and Bilic. I've um, heard stuff about yourself and Danny, who... My sister used to fancy the pants off, by the way. I mean, he was a good-looking lad. Oh, he was. He was. He was a good-looking lad, all right. 
um, but also some of your your trips that you had as well, because, you know, you would have been involved in pre-season trips where you're traveling to different countries. Is there anything else, anything in particular that really stands out in your mind, you know, funny stories that you could share, you know, with the audience? Yeah. I've got, there's probably three. I've got, I've, I can share three with you. So I'll, uh, mm. the, fir the first one I'll share with you was, um, I think it was around, it was around, around maybe November of the second season. Um, West Ham had signed uh, John Hartson and Paul Kitson. Okay. And uh, in around that period, maybe slightly after or in around, and they got a couple of really fantastic results. We beat Arsenal. Uh, I think we beat Arsenal in Upton Park, and it gave us a wee bit of a gap in the table and enabled us to be signed a safe. So Harry planned a, 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 a mid season break to Tenerife. They give the boys a bit of R and R and they do a wee bit of training. So the way, way it transpired for me was I was injured or had been injured and was coming back to the reserves. I was on the verge of coming back to the reserves. And on that Saturday, I think a couple of the first team had, had had sustained a couple of injuries. So they were they pulled out of the trip, which means they had to be backfilled by the young pros. So I was on a treatment table getting a wee bit of treatment and Frank Lampard Sr. came in to me and said to me, have you got a passport? And I said, I'm well, likely to think so. I flew, on, I flew under the country from Belfast. So I'm like, they think I have a passport. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to have come. So I said, you have a passport? Yeah. He said, you know where it is? I said, yep. He says, right, get your passport gathered up. Um, we're going to Tenerife on Monday. This was on the Saturday. We're going to Tenerife on Monday. So get your bags packed. Tell Eddie Gillum, as Gary was the, as the kit man, he says, tell Eddie yeah. Gillum to get you a suit bag, which I still have, ironically. I still have a suit bag somewhere. It's the only real memento I have left in West Ham. <laughs> and uh, off we went to... De Tenerife. Now it was really strange, and that we thought obviously we'd be traveling one flight to Tenerife, flying out of London. Yeah, we'll go be straight to Tenerife. But for some really strange reason, we flew via Madrid. And I always remember we flew to Madrid first, and then on to Tenerife. So obviously, it must have been a really cut price way to go to Tenerife. It didn't really make any sense because I looked at it on the map and was like, "We seem to be going way out of the way here." Yeah. And I remember on the flight on the way over by Sava Village. Obviously, wasn't a big fan of flying. It reminded me a wee bit of member uh, B. A. Baragas when he in the A team when he <laughs> and I ain't getting a no plane and he used to have to drug him to get him on the plane. Well, I was sat beside Slavin Bilic and the plane was taken off and Slavin was crossing himself about about <laughs> twenty times as the plane was up in the air and he was like a white look. He's holding on. I was looking at him. He was looking at me. And then he relaxed a bit. And then when the plane landed again, he was crossing himself on the way on the way back down again. And I remember thinking to myself, oh my God, what's going on here? So we landed and Harry, we all got onto this coach from the airport. And Harry announced this that, uh, right, lads, we're over here on a mid-season break. I'll give you the opportunity to have a beer, but it's really for training. So I want you to go and relax and we'll meet later on for, for a tea and we'll discuss what's happening. So mm -hmm. I thought, this is great. I thought, oh, fantastic. So into my room, they put me in with young Danny who signed signed shortly before and Danny obviously didn't speak a word of, of English and obviously me being Northern Irish, my English is a <laughs> is a very colloquial type of Northern Irish English yeah. so obviously it was already language barriers and I remember the two of us just looking at each other and just smiling and pointing a lot and you know gesturing <laughs> about about where we were going, where we were going out, where we were coming back in so I got my stuff settled in my room and all I heard was a knock on the door I thought who could be this and the door opened. I opened the door and Biggie and Dowie was at the door. Now, Big Dowie was an absolute character. Obviously, played for Northern Ireland. Knew I was one of the young Northern Irish lads. He says, come, in, come with me. We're all going for a walk. I thought, oh, right, great. The first team squad must be going for a walk. So I came out. And when I came out, we went down a left into the basement, which came out onto the promenade. And as I came out, it was me, uh, Ian Bishop, Keith Rowland, and Michael Hughes. So I already knew straight away that Bish, Bish liked to drink. Big Doy liked to drink. Michael Hughes probably liked to drink. Keith Rowland probably liked to drink. And then there was me. So I thought, this isn't going to end well. So off we went. We walked along the, the, the big promenade of Tenerife. It takes you out towards Los Cristianos direction. I think it goes up white weaves around the coast. And we were walking and you could hear, obviously, English tourists on holidays going, oh, look, there's, there's the West Ham first team. There's the West Ham first team. Mm -hmm. And the next thing was, we got so far and uh, Big Doy said, right, that's far enough. And we go. I said, where are we going? He says, we're going to have for a drink. So, <laughs> so straight away, we literally landed and within an hour, right, we were in a pub. So 
I was this young, young Northern Irish fella out in Tenerife for the West Ham first team. It was beautiful. The weather was beautiful. I'm drinking beer. I'm obviously, I've had a beer, but I wouldn't exactly say that I'm a particularly strong drinker. So I'm drinking away at these beers and they were laughing because it was like a Sunday in the bar. It was an outside bar, obviously. And as the sun was moving, I was moving my chair. So I was going round, following the sun round. The rest of the boys were sat at the table and I was moving round trying to get as much sun as I could. Uh, and, was, and more and more beer kept coming out. And there was, and then the next thing, Bess ordered a, a round of tequilas. And I remember we all had a tequila and Big Downer drunk his tequila and straight away threw it back up again. And then another round of tequilas came in because he poked that up and we all had another tequila and he poked it up again. And I, can't have, yeah. north, I can't have a North Downer. I can't have a North third round. Third round the, so eventually it came, we were there for about three hours. I know, as you know, when you're sitting drinking, you don't really notice it as much until you actually get up. And I just remember that suddenly he says, right, boys, we've got this first team. We've got this first team meal at seven o'clock. We need to go back. So this was about, I'd say this must have been about half five. And we knew it was about a 20 to 30 minute walk back to the hotel. So we started to walk back in the hotel. So somebody came up, I think it was Bish came up with this formation that because I, I was the youngest and clearly I was drunk, I would go first. He would have then Keith Roland and Michael Hughes decided that what they would do, they, they obviously take the glare and eyes off us. They would go via the beach. They would walk along the beach. So they had me at the front, uh, Bish in the middle and Big Dye at the back. And then on the beach, you'd make us using Keith Rowland, who were clearly as, as as drunk as I was. So we're all walking along. Back. I was holding on to, there was a big railing that ran the whole length of the big long promenade, and I was holding it. And I could see these people looking at me and then twigging and then going, there's just because obviously Bish with his long flowing locks, a big downer, obviously distinctive looking bloke as well. Yeah. And I just remember walking along and he'd been going, that's West Ham. And my God, they look drunk. So... We got back into the hotel, and the way it was was the hotel was on like a split level. So the ground level was there was a lift. So I remember coming in. I was the first to arrive back at the back at the hotel, short, shortly followed by the rest of the boys. So I came in, and the rest of them were coming in in drips and drabs. And as I came in, Big Alvin Martin was standing at the lift, holding the lift open. And he says, and obviously he's got Alvin's got that wee bit of sort of he's a wee bit of Liverpoolian sort of accent or whatever his twang is. And he just grabbed me by the scruff of my neck and pulled me in. He says, get in this lift. He says, Harry knows that some of right drinking. He can't confirm which ones are right because some of the boys are elsewhere. But he says, he knows that boys are right drinking. So he says, get you in this lift quick. He says, I'll get you up to your room. And I remember he was just he was just holding me up like, oh, Alvin's a big lump of that. I'm yeah. this skinny framed Irish man, you know. So he's holding me in the lift. But the lift doors are still open. And the stairs zigzagged up. So And at the top of the stairs was a mirror wall. So I could see high Redman's feet at the top of the stairs. I could see from the left, right? And I could see Ian Doy and Bish heading up that way. And the left was still open. I hadn't yeah. closed it. And I was still looking. And I could see, I, next thing I could see was, D D Downer had obviously got the level where Harry could see him. And I could see, I could see the reflection. And I heard Harry obviously going, you absolute disgrace. Look at the shape of you, you disgrace. Now, meanwhile, when he was giving Harry, he was giving uh, Doy a hard time, Bish got him behind a pot plant, a big leafy pot plant. But it was like, the, the bush was moving because Bish was laughing that much. And you could see the bush going back and forth. And I remember Doy was like, pardon my French, but Doy was like, fuck off, fuck off, Harry, fuck off. He didn't care. And he, so he walked on past Harry. So this obviously infuriated Harry even more. Meanwhile, Bish was still behind the pot plant. And he, Doy was like, or Harry was like, Bish, I can see you two. Get out from behind the plant. And then Bish, Bish came up and staggered on. So anyway, the left door's closed. So I thought, oh, I'm for here. He's going to know. He's going to, we're going to be all sitting at this big table. He's going to know boys were drinking. So I get into the room. Danny wasn't there, but that wasn't uncommon for Danny because Danny used to go AWOL all the time. I'm going to write yeah. back days later. So <laughs> I went into my room and I just remember holding on to the shower curtain. It was an old sort of fabric shower curtain and swinging around in the bath and trying to hold myself up in the shower and the shower came on and I remember I fell I fell out of I fell out of the shower and I landed on the floor and the door opened and it was Slav and Bilic and Slav I was obviously completely naked sliding across the floor and he, he obviously knew and Slav, Slav was going no it has obviously question or Jesus look at the shape of him he was like he couldn't believe it he was like oh my god so he was like get he, so he, he kind of helped me he says get get chains get chains so I got downstairs, 
into the meeting the fall. I got down there early and it was a big long table. So obviously there was about twenty two of us in this big long table high at one end. So I got to the furthest end thinking to myself, I'm gonna give myself a chance here to get away with it. So I thought there's gonna be I swear to God we're gonna get caught here, right? And the next thing, so we're all sitting at the table, but he, he, uh, Keith Rowland and Michael Hughes weren't there. So the next thing happened, the door bust open and <laughs> Michael Hughes came in first, right? And then behind him came Keith Rowland and Keith Rowland's chin was sellotaped from there <laughs> up over his head. And you could see there was a big split chin where he'd obviously he'd fallen on the beach, split his chin open. Uh, Michael Hughes obviously blocked, had done a DIY uh, sell tape job and just let me sell tape that around his head. So obviously, <laughs> once once he came up like that, obviously that completely threw the whole arrangement. So Harry was giving them saying, "Look at this shit, he's an absolute disgrace." He yeah. stormed off. Harry stormed off out of the room, up to his room. We had dinner and I scarpered back up to my room. But I, I still maintain to this day, if I hadn't been for uh, Keith Rowan falling over on the beach, splitting his chin open, and Michael Hughes doing the worst first aid job that he'd ever seen where he just sell taped it, I might have been caught drinking that day. So Brilliant. obviously I got away with it, but there was a knock-on effect of that because uh, <laughs> Ian Doy Ian Doy and John Harks, John Harks obviously played for America, was yeah. also in that trip, right? And obviously the way it was back then was the maximum you could be fined for, not for, for uh, an infraction was a two-week wages. So Doy, he really told Doy, I'm going to find you two weeks wages. So Ian Doy thought, fuck it, I'm going to get fined two weeks wages. I'm just going to party the rest of the time. So literally from that day, we went, we went out one of the next nights for a beer and Doy went AWOL. Him and John, John Harks went AWOL until the end of the trip. They were away for about four days and Doy came back to the airport on the last day with a big one and big Mexican sombrero hats <laughs> and, 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 and shorts and a t-shirt. Had been away on the drink for four days. Hadn't come anywhere near the training camp. And I just remember how I was going absolutely mental. Like, but it was it was just cra- it was just crazy the fact that they didn't care him and Har- Harks didn't care if he was alone. I think he just yeah. come back from the World Cup, and uh, he just he didn't really care. But like the, the laugh the laughs that I got out of that it was just like and it was just Slavin Beric obviously being a professional, mm. I know, sorry, a real proper professional. He was like he says like oh my god you're all alcoholics. He couldn't believe it. <laughs> he says you're all alcoholics. He couldn't get over it. You know. Oh, and the funny thing the funny thing about that was too that. That trip to Tenerife featured in Harry's autobiography because it was in with Danny, and because obviously the the whole the whole the whole sort of furore about Danny signing this really good looking model model. I remember I remember half the fellas you used to say half the fellas fancy Danny never made half the woman, you know. Yeah. But uh, and that was, it was in the book, and it was funny because there's a quote from Harry the next morning where he said uh, he said about a young Irish lad rooming in the hotel or was rooming with Danny. I put him in my head. And he says, Where, where's Danny? And I, my reply in the quote, the quote was, I don't know, boss, I haven't seen him. And I always yeah. joke with me mates at the pub, who would I get to play my role if that ever went to a movie? You know, which which movie star would do, would do my voice line there, you know? But unbelievable, man. Unbelievable. I, do you know, I, I remember that, because I've, I've got that autobiography from, from, from Harry, and I've, I've read that snippet. I know exactly what you're talking about. I mean, yeah. brilliant, I mean unbelievable story. To, well, yeah. it is an unbelievable story, but it's... Yeah, incredible, right? I mean, what an experience that must have been. Yeah. And it, okay. as I say, it's funny too because whenever I talk back about the stories, and the majority of my stories, like, are all old school football stories, but there, there's always alcohol, you know, involved yeah. in some capacity. And I always joke that it was Arsene Wenger obviously ruined ruined football for the boys that enjoyed a beer because obviously Arsene came in, he changed Arsenal that they, they were all eating healthy food, whereas. We were, we were getting our dinner at the ground and Cheryl, the girl that was doing her food, you yeah, know, yeah. Like lasagna and chips or a fry on a Friday. You know, there was none of this, there was none of this pasta or nothing. We were, you know, when you were getting more cheese, can I get more cheese in my chips, Cheryl? And yeah. go on, do that sausage a bit longer and there'll be fat fryer there, you know? God, God rest her soul, you know, but if she's still alive, I hope, but, but it was just an unbelievable uh, experience. Yeah. And just saying about, I remember, I remember too, the, the, my, that first, that first, uh, that first Christmas, there was West Ham as well. Sorry, not, not that Christmas because the same Christmas, but next Christmas, we had a Christmas do. And obviously, Harry banned the Christmas do shortly after that, but we were dating Rockford, and the Christmas do was fancy dress. So you had, yeah. you had, you had, uh, you had Ian, Ian Doyle, you had uh, Big David Unsworth, uh, and Mark Reaper, I think, dressed as the Three Musketeers. You had <laughs> you had uh, Dixie in a romper, st- romper suit doing George Doors, though. Yeah. <laughs> 
he was just a full romper suit <laughs> just to push the pram. You had, yeah. you had other ones. You had, oh, it was, and I remember us going around all these bars and all the West and people going, Jesus, there's Dixie and p- people laughing their heads off him pushed the pram with a you know, proper full on romper suit. You know, yeah. and then I remember we went to one of the bars and we went upstairs and the, the pram came over the came over the top of the bar down the stairs, pointing down the stairs and all. I think <laughs> shortly after that, Harry banned all the Christmas dudes because I think they were a bit they were a bit uh, touchy. But the funny thing about that was there, there was the big the big club in Romford. Was that secrets? You got Hollywoods. Um, I don't know if you talk about Hollywoods there. There was quite a few, right? I'm trying to Hollywoods. I think they called it time. I don't know, was it time and end for it or Hollywoods? It must be. It might have been Hollywoods. You know what, what they did was they hired they hired they hired out Hollywoods. Yeah. And so we had a Christmas day in Hollywoods, and I just remember, right? Obviously, you're the young pro. They're sending you up. They're a big drinks, Kelly. So they're sending you up. You know, we twenty quid, and they're going get us two foggers and a Red Bull, and you can keep the change. And I remember coming home that night after the Christmas day, where I emptied out my pockets, and I must have had about three hundred pound and pound coins. I don't know. I don't know how my trousers stayed up. Every, every time I was going the around, around, they were giving me money, and I was doing the change. And I went, "I'll just keep the change." And there was more common. Like I remember my trousers. I had the pockets and my trousers were ruined. They were that baggy. <laughs> so you, so great characters you're talking about there, but. Who are the biggest characters? I mean, who were like the biggest lager heads at West Ham? Who were the real characters that you can recall? I mean, obviously you mentioned Dowie being one of them, uh, right? Bishop right. and so on. Who were the ones of, that really stand out? I have a lot of time for Ian Bishop. Ian Bishop, great fella, great lad, yeah. real down to earth, um, real, real sort of character. Mm. Sort of good, great banter with him. Um, big doy, big doy was no because I was from Northern Ireland and obviously he was an international for us. To be fair to him, he was very, very good, very good. You know, made me feel very welcome. Same with Michael Hughes, Keith Rowland, Stevie Lomas, who who is now living quite close to me, who I'd be very friendly with. Who we both played in the same youth team, so he came yeah. over, to, over to Man City from the youth team that I played in, but I was a few years below him age wise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there were some characters, John Moncur, another one, absolute madman. John Moncur. John Moncur, absolute madman. You got any stories on him aside from oh, the one where he covers himself in paint, right, or runs around? Know, naked. There for that one, there was also another one that he did where he, uh, it there used to be the there used to be like a, a health club that, that all the players used to go to for their recuperation. Had like I think it had a bowl alley attached to it. Used to be in the outskirts of used to be in the outskirts of of somewhere close to Chabal, Romford Heath. Or sorry, yeah, Romford, Chabal, Heath. Collier Road, maybe you're talking about. I mean, it was that right? And I remember one time he. He came, he came out of that and uh, he had been training and he'd obviously gone to the QR completely naked and he drove the QR back naked and he put down the window and asked somebody for directions and it was completely starters. <laughs> Absolute. Uh, but he was, because I know he, he, I think he was f- quite friendly with Gaza. So I think he's obviously, yeah. he had Gaza overtures back then. I know he's, I think he's a reformed character now as far as, far as I'm aware because I was chatting to a few people about him. But yeah. um, he, he was a real character. You know, our boys like Tim Breaker, um, Tony Cotty, yeah, Tony Cotty, and Laura, Laura Lovely fell. Love this. Used to always used to say to me about uh, get me a Bill Rothy, uh, uh, some Aka and uh, no Allens. And I used to go, What? And he goes, Bill Rothy coffee, no Aka, Aka pilk, give me some Aka pilk, and no, no Allen, no Allen sugars. So I was <laughs> got to know all the West Ham jargon very quickly, you know. Um, I'm trying to think off, uh, Dixie, obviously, absolute. Dixie's a funny one because um, obviously I knew Dixie's reputation before I came to West Ham. Mm. But if you were to, if you were to ask me which player did I think was the standout player in West Ham, for me, Julian Dix was an absolute baller. Like he was an absolute baller. Fair enough, he had that reputation, yeah. but he had the sweetest left foot I ever seen. He like I remember never used to warm up anytime you're in the first team. Used to ton of coke. I think he used to ton of coke in a bath. He used to have a bath. Never yeah. really did any running before the match. Mm. Um, remember him going out for training in the mornings. Used to come out. Used to be funny. Used to wear obviously the three quarter length bottoms top and a Benny hat. And he would have come yeah. out and he would have got the young apprentices clipping balls to the edge of the penalty area. And he would have been volleying them in the top corner. Boom, 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 boom. Um, just consistently hit the top corner. Literally, obviously aggressive competitor. Um, real well to win, but still maintain that. His reputation went before him because he should have got more England caps than what he did. You know, considering at that time, Hinchcliffe was the other mm. left back who was 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 in the running for the team. Mm. Dix for me, like 
he, he obviously had the had the shaven head, maybe the image that the, the, the sort of the the, the, the early FA didn't want, but for a Baldy talent, it was phenomenal, and he was brilliant for West Ham as well. Scored some penalties were like Ray Stewart from back in the day, oh. where he, the way he, he used to smash and Tonka, you know, he was the same. Just and you know, and I remember often one of my my favorite games was the time um, where we we West uh, we played United. And I think we came back from two 0 down, and I think we drew two two. And yeah. I remember that he hit Cantona, he hit he hit Cantona and King in a double tackle, and yeah. I remember he jumped up and he grabbed one, and, and I think he grabbed King, and I think Cantona looked over and realised who it was, and yeah. kind of decided he would just sort of leave it. You know, yeah. Cantona was a hard was a hard man, but just yeah. remember, he just sort of as well won. But with a lot of with a lot of good characters, like you see, it was an injustice that he never. I mean, he never got a cap for England, Dixie, did he? I think he was in England. Like, I think he got a B cap, didn't he? I think he got a yeah, B cap, he got a B, but not for the obviously for the, the you know the the A yeah. team or whatever. Yeah. I never got a cap, and for me, I never understood why. You know, because when I used to watch him play week in week out, I was like, this guy is just unbelievable. He's, I mean, that's why he's a legend, right? At West Ham, every West Ham fan loves Dixie because he was a fantastic player, amazing left foot, great competitor. I mean, if it really was down to his haircut and his reputation, then more for England because at the time, I mean, we had Stuart Pearson there, obviously, but he was coming towards the tail end of his career. Yeah, we had people like Andy Hinch, Cliff Graham, the so for me, Dixie gets in above those guys right. any day of the week. He was a quality player, wasn't he? I mean, it's yeah. it's a real grave injustice that he never made the England squad. It really is. No, He's a great player, totally. And obviously, he had his reputation of being a hard man, but you mm. know, he had a dry sense of humour. But he 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 would be he'd have been a friendly fella. You know, he would. He wouldn't. There certainly wouldn't have been any airs of graces with Dixie. He would have been very down to earth. The, I know the young youth team players and the young apprentices all 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 loved him because of his banter. And he, you know, he he, he would have he would have ribbed the young boys as much as he would have ribbed the first team. Yeah. I, I, I often remember we used to do his lunchtime. Was obviously he was a very very talented golfer. He, he used to bring his golf clubs at, at, at lunchtime and smash them across Chadwell Heath, smash the balls across Chadwell Heath, and get the young <laughs> apprentices to run and get them for him. And a lot of <laughs> A lot of the time, they would be picking up the balls, and they'd be lashing balls past them, so the balls flying past their heads. Yeah. Where he has the patience to wait for them to come back for the balls, you know. Oh, but God. absolute, it's, absolute uh, star, like. Yeah, no, he, he really, really was, and um, I think you're you're so lucky that you you played in that generation amongst those players because for me, looking back as I was a kid back then, right, I was a teenager, but they were all effectively you know, heroes to us right back in the 90s no no question about it but it's, it's amazing to hear those stories and I know that you and I could probably talk about the stories that you have we could create a whole blimmin you know series of podcasts around this <laughs> I know we spoke offline about some of the things that obviously you got up to yeah. um so maybe we'll park that and we'll do some more of those stories so I'm sure people want yeah. to hear that but uh, I've got got to them. yeah sorry Graham. again as I say I'll be happy to share with them you some other time you know sure yeah. they're, they're absolute gold and i think this is we love to hear these kind of stories because sadly as we pointed out earlier you're not going to hear the nitty-gritty what goes on behind the scenes with footballers nowadays it's all very hush hush and mm. i can recall the whole hearts and berkovich incident you know that obviously put a real stop to even being able to come into the training ground anymore right that that just yeah. was to bed and it was a real shame but i think you know obviously football's changed it's evolved you know we don't hear what's going on but Love to hear those stories because, look, at the end of the day, as you know, and you were one of them, footballers are just human beings and they just get up to just as much mischief as <laughs> than a normal human yeah. being. And that's I great think, to hear. I think, uh, Chris, social media will be, has been a big killer too because back in yeah. those days, back in those days, you could get away with doing that type of stuff. Yeah. And it, 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 it would eventually filter into the, into the sort of community. But, you know, obviously people would add on bits. But now with fo video phones, people just start recording stuff like that. And before you know, it's banged on the social media. And that's why players now have, you know, the, the, the sort of scrutiny that they have now is phenomenal. You know, to be a player now, the scrutiny is phenomenal. And the intrusion on your private life. Obviously, some people will say, well, it's part and parcel of the game. You're, you're, you're being paid big money by clubs. You, you've got people coming to pay to support you. You know, but but as I say, it must be very difficult for a lot of players, and you know, they stay on the straight and narrow, and and not yeah. occasionally fall off the rails. You know. Yeah, no, I can imagine that. I mean, it's and it must be quite an isolating life in that respect as well, because there's only so much that they can do, you know, publicly. So it, I can understand that. But look, they get paid great money, Graham. Right? They get great money for the privilege of playing for West Ham. So I suppose making those sacrifices for say 10, 15 years of when they're at the top, it's all got to be worth it, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, there's as you well know, football's a short career, so mm. um, you've got to you've got to you know 
keep your nose to the grindstone while you're playing and try and earn as much money as possible, you know. And obviously, there's big financial rewards if you do that. If you're able to sort of maintain a good level and even even lower le- league level now, and I, I know it's like in Northern Ireland where a lot of teams over here have gone professional. Um, mm. the money the money now and even our local game is phenomenal. It's just crazy. So as I say, football was always going to be the same. You know, it, the the American sports have always been well ahead of European sports when it came to the financial side of things. So it was always going to be a matter of time before you know football caught up with sort of the type of money that you're talking about the NBA stars and the baseball stars get, you know. So it was always going to happen, and like you don't have to look now at some of the contracts and some you know, especially the the Saudi league. Some of the money has been fired out in the Saudi leagues. That's ridiculous. It's absolutely you know. Not only can you set yourself up for life, but you you can set up about twenty generations of your family. You know. Oh, it's, 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 it's unbelievable. It is. But I suppose a lot of it's relative to time as well, because I know there was obviously a lot of money going around back in, back in the day as well. But obviously it's, it's escalated out of all proportion yeah. nowadays. Um, when you were at West Ham as well, and I'm just thinking about this off the top of my head, the Foreign Legion, so you would have definitely been a part of that based on the years that you were at West Ham. Mm-hmm. Tell me a little bit about that. What was that like when you got the likes of Florin Radachayu, you know, Dimitrescu, Futra, all those kind of players? Because... Presumably, they would have all been part of that squad that you're a part of, right? Yeah, oh, definitely. I remember whenever I signed. I remember the Hammers news came out uh, in January, and it, that that was the headline: the Foreign Legion, and obviously Slavin had come in at that time, hmm. and we had um around that rhyme off some of the names. Obviously, Mark Reaper was big. Reaps was there. Um, you then had shortly after that Florin Radachoy, Eli Dimitrescu, who obviously the two Romanians that had played in the World Cup for Romania. You had Paolo Futre, who, who obviously had the famous incident with John. Moncur over the number, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, as well, uh, you had um, Hugo Preferio, who also came in from Portugal, was in there around that time. Can I just stop you there for Grant? Because I'm really interested to get your opinion on this, right? So Hugo Preferio, I remember him because I thought he was electric when I watched him play. And when I compare him to players like Danny, who came to West Ham, who was meant to be this, you know, big superstar, and maybe he didn't have the career that maybe people expected him to have because perhaps he was sidetracked you know with all of the other stuff that you like to get involved in you've got people like Paolo Futre, Florian Radachayu these were these were big names right yeah. big names back then I think Radachayu Dimitrescu were part of the World Cup 94 squad yeah. I think Radachayu was one of the top goal scorers in 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 the World Cup of 94 right, yes, right. yeah. um that didn't really work out but how are those players we're talking about right you know the Radachayus the Futres the Porfirios the Dannys who who really stood out as being like, oh my God, this this guy is world class. Well, it's funny you should mention about Hugo Preferio, because I agree with you. I thought Hugo Preferio was an absolute smasher of a player. Yeah. I'm not sure what happened around that time. I know he was very slight in stature, but he had great mm. feet. He was quite yeah. nippy as well. And I remember he was extremely talented. Obviously, you know, it's, it's funny too, because we had that many foreign players at that time that I'm probably I'm probably missing some major players. I know obviously Slavon Bilic was mm. was was a top quality. I, I, I think it was only a couple of million. For him, very low. Yeah, he's about. I think for recollection, he cost us four and a half million, which would have still been a lot back then. But by yeah. comparison, nothing for the level and, of defender. And, 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 and obviously, he 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 was a fantastic player. Hmm. Um, as I say, I'm probably I'm probably I'm not doing justice to some of the other players that were obviously in there around that time because obviously there was English based players, but John Hartson came in around that time as well. Yeah, he was exceptional, wasn't he? Uh, I'll yeah. tell you, the horrible too. Paul Kitson was a fantastic signer for West Ham at that time. Hmm. Remember that yeah. time they went on a fantastic run. Him and Kitson, Kitson and Hartson formed an unbelievable relationship in regards yeah. to Kitson was strong and obviously could hold up a ball as well as Hartson could. And K- Kitson, I remember, I remember Kitson had a fairly, fairly big reputation as being a proper hard man as well. I think it was a fairly, he was fairly useful. I, I think he was a fairly, useful, I, I oh, a fairly wow. use, useful boy. Yeah, uh, I think was, he was, wasn't that. one. No, he wasn't one to be messed with. From mm. what I think, are obviously a Jordy, he's a Jordy lad. And yeah. I remember, I remember Roley saying to me, "No, he's a hardy boy. He can look after himself." You know, when he he wow. played like that, so he was a brilliant. He was a brilliant signing uh, in the around that period. But as I say, when you're talking about the foreign players, I'm probably you know, if, if, when I go off the air, you know, I'll probably think to yourself, "Why didn't they mention him?" Or why didn't they mention him? Um, see, Paulo Fitri clearly you could see was a talented boy, but he was at the end of his career, and obviously yeah. it was a bit of a it was a bit of a gamble for Harry because he obviously wasn't going to cost much money. I'm not sure what his wages were, but obviously mm. he was just be playing at a far different level um i think somebody coming into the premier league at that age is at his age no matter what ability you have it's frightening considering yeah. you know if you look at dimitrescu and radachoy they came into our league and struggled as many foreign players have over the years where it's just the speed and the 
sort of the way the game's played in that in, in our country. You know, those continental players are used to sort of slower game, you know, more build up and then quicker into the final third, whenever it, that's when it all speeds up. Whereas in, in in England in the Premier League, you know, obviously it's frantic, it's really fast paced. It's it's that combined. You know, it's ninety minutes of teams just moving yeah. a ball quickly, as Man City do really well. I mean, I, I expected a lot from Radachaya when we signed him. I was quite excited about that. And I was really disappointed that it didn't work out. But I think it was a physicality, right? And maybe the speed of the Premier League yeah. didn't suit him. I, I'll, well, there was that too. And then there was a fact he was the one that went missing one Saturday and went to Harvey next with his wife instead of going <laughs> to a game. So yeah. I think I think the lure of London was a big thing for, you know, especially those players coming from Romania, you know, the Eastern Bloc countries, obviously coming into London and, you know, it's a different experience for them, and, and you know the opportunity to go to all these places that they would never actually have been in. You know, and I think a lot of them took the egg off the ball. Dumitrescu obviously had been at Spurs before that, and mm. you know he he'd been he looked all right at Spurs, but he just didn't he didn't set the world light at West Ham. I think I think what what the, the good thing about West Ham is they had a good a good nucleus of home based players. And by home based players, I mean players player, players from obviously Northern Ireland, uh, Wales, and England. Um, mm. So we had, we had good, you know, your from your Northern Ireland contingent there are Michael Hughes, Keith Rowland, Steve Lomas, Ian Doyle, all good pros. You know, your Hartsons, your Kitsons, you know, Dixie. You know, you've got the likes of Big Reaps there who, who had been at West Ham for a few years and I mean, knew what West Ham was about, you know. Yeah, um, he was Reap. I liked him. I'll tell you, you're saying about players, you obviously didn't. Danny Williamson was a player and mm. obviously had injury problems, but you're saying, yeah. you see, it's. It's all coming back to me now when I think when I go back that era. Danny Williamson looked a proper player and just injuries just completely curtailed. Yeah, it's such a shame, isn't it? I liked him and I remember I remember nice one fella too. the goal he scored against uh, Bolton Wanderers where he took it from his own, I think it from his own goal, uh, from his own goal, ran the right. full length of the pitch and slotted it past their keeper. And I think we we sold him, didn't we? We sold him to Everton and then just the injuries just completely yeah. ruined his career. It's a shame, real shame. Yeah, yeah, but he was a nice fella as well. So, but as I say, we had a good you're a good nucleus of players. You know, you're good pros. You're Steve Potts, yeah. playing pro for West Ham. Your Alvin Martins in the background there was near the end of his career. Um, Tim Breaker, athlete, athlete lovely yeah. fella as well. Good pro. So you had a lot of good, good pros in that team there. And you, you know, you, you, you had a bit of flair in certain areas too. You know, boys that could play. So you had a good mix. And to be fair, like, <laughs> like it, it was an interesting period because West Ham in that mid nineties. Always managed to dig out good big results at big times. You know, pull, they always pulled themselves clear of the relegation. So it was always a wee bit of a roller coaster where you were down. You know, you're in the fringes of. And let's be honest, the Premier League back there was mental. You had a really, really good Wimbledon team who were horrible to play against. You, had, you had physical teams. You know, so yeah. so you know to be able to pull yourself out of the sort of relegation zone and generally finished quite safe every season was a fairly achievement, you know, with, with yeah. a fairly limited budget, I'll be fair to say. Yeah. No, no, you, you, you're right. I mean, it, it was, it was for me, I loved that era of football. I absolutely loved it. And obviously I was in my teens, so I was kind of really in, in my kind of prime of going to West Ham and really going week in, week out with my mates, with my family. I loved it. It was brilliant. Mm. Absolutely brilliant. We, we've obviously spoken about some of the great players you played with at West Ham, and you mentioned Dixie being probably the number one most talented player at West Ham. Um, yeah. Were there any players at West Ham that you you didn't like? I wouldn't say there was any players that didn't like us. I think I think for some of the we, we mentioned there um, some of the players coming in. Certainly, the local base players were always very very approachable. So you mm. never, as a young pro going there, you know. You never really had any issue, as I say, with your likes, your um, your Potsies or your TCs or sort of any of those players. Your Tim Breaker, you know, they, they were all very approachable. Some of the some some of the foreign players you, you were saying there about um, Eli Dimitrescu, yeah. he would have come across very abrupt. But I put that down to possibly him obviously not being being from a different country, maybe not having a total grasp of the language. He, he would have come across as particularly a, a particularly abrupt. But then again, he, he you know he he probably seen it. He was a first, he was a established first team player. I was only a young French first team player, you know. Not yeah. saying he was ever rude to me per se, but you wouldn't have got the same warmth from the likes of him that you would have got from from your your Alvin Martins, yeah. who who for me was an absolute legend at West Ham and, and such a nice fella and you know so down to earth and passing on advice and giving you a bit of his sort of bit of his experience and never. Always had time for you. Always wanted to speak to you, you know. So, you know, I can't really fault that era. Um, 
like the players, even the player, the majority of players that came in, they were all. It was it was just such a great time to be involved with a club, and, yeah. re- and and even though I was only there for the three years, the memories that I made in that time were like phenomenal. You know, still, my mates still ask stories and and down my local pub, my dad, and all he enjoys. He you know he'll so friends of his will ask me about stories about that era too, and you know just and if you're a football person and you love football, you love stories, you love hearing stuff like that because you love hearing players that are human and like yourself and like to go for a beer and get into the odd bit of mischief, you know? So, as I say, it's yeah, just, it's just a, it was an honour to, to be a footballer. You know, it's it's something that not many players can say they've done and it's something that I'll, I'll obviously cherish to the day of day. Yeah. No, do you know what? You're absolutely right. And I've got to ask you the question, Grant, just focusing back to you again. Um, any regrets at all? Um, when you look back on your spell at West Ham three years, is there anything that you would have done differently? Do you think? Um, yeah, yeah. See, see, maturity is an no hindsight. Maturity are a good thing, you know. Going over a twenty, new experience, trying to settle in. It was always going to be difficult, but I, personally, I probably could have worked harder. You know, mm. I could have taken a leaf out of the likes of Frank Lampard's book and done extra training. I probably, I could probably could have had one less pint in the bar. I probably, you know, there's many a thing I could have done. Mm. Um, I wouldn't change my experiences. I would have been. I, it was funny the way it panned out too because if Alvin Martin, Alvin had gone to the South End manager and if Alvin had stayed at South End, I was going to be moving to South End when I left West Ham. Okay. And Alvin lost his job, so that fell through. And a brief spell at Wigan, nothing materialised from that and then eventually went, I decided that I wasn't going to stay in England after the create me West Ham, uh, West Ham contract ended and I went back to Northern Ireland to finish my degree. <laughs> Personally, I probably should have stayed in England for another couple of years. Um, I probably would have been good enough to play lower level, but mm. I made the decision to come back home because I was offered a fairly fairly good terms to come back. Um, and my, my football went a different career. I went back to playing in the Irish League. Um, but but the memories I have are like they're there. And something you know, money's great. You get money, and money money comes and money goes. But yeah. you know, the memories you build are with you for the rest of your life. You know, absolutely, absolutely. Um. Yeah, no, I, I I completely agree with you. I think it's um you can't. I don't think you can live your life with regrets. I definitely don't think you can. Um, clearly, you don't have regrets. You've enjoyed your experiences there. But do you feel you're always given a fair crack of the whip at West Ham? I mean, did you feel that perhaps maybe you weren't given the opportunities that you felt you deserved at particular times? Well, there's a possibility. I remember. I remember. I was told one time that. At that time, Harry was doing a wee bit of wheeling and dealing. And I know Harry doesn't like that wheeler, wheeler, dealer, card, sort of car dealer type phrase, which is used by some of the newspapers. I know he, but Harry had a habit of signing players and moving them on. Yeah. And, and I, I I, was told that I was signed with that purpose. And I was signed with the purpose of getting them over to England for a few years and then maybe moving me on to a lower division club with a, at a profit. So whether I was ever destined to be a West Ham first team player, I don't know. I, I was close on the first. Um, I made the I made the squad for a, a penultimate game in my first season, and I remember doing really well training. And I remember Frank, the late Frank Burrows, who was a brilliant, a brilliant coach for our reserves, great, great experience. I remember him saying to me a few times that, look, if you knock down a bit here, you're not far off here that you might get the opportunities. But the opportunities didn't really materialise. Maybe I wasn't just up to the level. Maybe it was the fact that West Ham were going through always go through those relegation battles, and there was never a period where. You were safe, and it was you had the opportunity to blood young players unless they were outstanding, like yeah. your real Ferdinand or your Frank Lampard, you know. Um, yeah. But you know, but uh, as I say, they obviously seen enough of me to sign me, to sign me at that time. And as I say, I seen, I, I was there for the full duration of my contract, so obviously it was good enough to be to be kept there for that period of time. You know, maybe it wasn't good enough to get another extension, but it was good enough to stay for the duration of the original contract. Yeah. And you made the bench, didn't you, as well for West Ham? Yes, I did. Yes, and yeah. I played. I played a few. I played a few first team games pre season stuff, and I always did fairly well. But yeah. I think there was always more established players in the position that obviously were going to be going to be hard to jostle out of their positions, you know. But as I say, it's it's all great learning, you know. Whether you succeed or whether you don't succeed, you, there's great learning to be taken from it, you know. And obviously, I've taken great learning from my West Ham experiences. Did um, leaving West Ham. How how did that affect you mentally? Um, because obviously the lure of playing for a, a massive Premier League club, right? Um, and then, with respect, playing for lower league teams. How did that affect you mentally at that particular time when well, you were at West Ham and they didn't renew your contract? 
Well, the, the way it, the way it kind of panned out is you can't you kind of the way you know you, you kind of have an inkling because obviously your 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 contract is really it runs to the summer and then your new contract starts again when the when obviously it's year to year but you kind of you kind of judge it by the playing season so yeah. you know to, if you're halfway through a playing season and you're coming to the end of your contract and you haven't been spoken to you know there's a good chance you're going to be you're going to be released from your contract so I knew sort of maybe three or four months before the end of my contract that I knew that I was going to be released. Obviously, I had I had accepted the fact that it was highly unlikely I was going to break into the first team at West Ham anyway. So it, it wasn't really a big disappointment. I saw it maybe as an opportunity for a new challenge. Um, yeah. And as I say, I had a couple of experiences of going up to clubs and seeing if I fancied them or not. I remember going up to North of England to Wigan and I remember <laughs> my mates were all at university up there so that was quite, kind of good and it, I knew people from home. But I got offered a decent contract to come back home to Northern Ireland and I always had aspirations of finishing my degree anyway. So um, I came back and finished, finished, finished that and I had a fairly successful Irish League career. Played over yeah. 400, 400 to 500 games. Um, so, so I still got to enjoy my football. Obviously, not to the same level as as I was at West Ham, but um, still had, a, had as high as you could play back in the home country, you know. The way I see this and the way I'm sure a lot of West Ham fans watching this video will see this is you've lived the dream that many of us would have loved to have lived, right? To have been part of a squad at West Ham, to be on the cusp of the first team, to be on the make the bench for the first team to play with the calibre of players that you played with. I think it's a fantastic achievement. I really do. And um, as you say, it's so difficult for even, you know, there's some incredibly talented players out there that don't necessarily make it to the top for whatever That's reason. Right. It be. Um, but what an achievement, you know, what what, what a memory, uh, what a, well, memory, shall we say, because there are a mm -hmm. whole load more. And I'd love to talk to you again about this, Graham. I think um, stories about Carrick being your, cleaning your boots, right? He used to clean your boots, didn't he? <laughs> That's right, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Really I remember the time at the Champions League final, Manchester United beat Chelsea, and um, obviously Rio Ferdinand and Carrick were playing for Man United, and Frank Lampard was, was playing for Chelsea. And I remember, yeah. I remember being in the bar, and the bar was packed, and I remember one of my mates shouting over the barman that see that fellow over there with a slightly tubby belly. He used to play with M3 <laughs> at West Ham, and you can see the barman looking over and obviously having a good laugh to himself, and then. And he says, where did it all go wrong? And I says, for who? For them or me? Anything, you know? <laughs> so, he does, so that got a good giggle in the bar anyway, you know. So, um, And I still, my, my boys, I say my young lads are football daft. They're a bit like me. Um, they're really young young and enthusiastic about it. And they enjoy the fact that their dad, their dad obviously rubs shoulders with a lot of these top professionals. And right. I send them the old footage. I send them the old footage of the old, the old uh, 1990s football. And mm. they can't get over how crazy it is the tackles are flying and everywhere and you know no var and the mucky pitches and you know you're the the hard men of the game as they were back then there was so many every team had maybe a couple of hard men on their team that could mix it as well you know so they are absolutely considering they know premier league football as they do now where you can't touch anybody you can't tackle you can't you know var rules everything out so as i say you give me that 1990s football any day of the week over football oh, yeah. i don't care whether Teams play beautiful football on the deck. Give me old school football where teams go at it hammer and tong, yeah. and the unpredictability as you had back then, any day of the week over the Premier League now. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with you. I think football's all the worse for it. The fact that it's changed like this, it really is. It really is. I miss I miss the nineties, but um, like, still love West Ham. Do you still do you still follow West Ham, Graham? I do, I do. Um, I, I, um, I'm a Wolves supporter through birth, so. Obviously, mm -hmm. I know the trial and tribulations of following a club that obviously, you know, has a, has a big history, but doesn't always get to where it needs to be. But my two uncles, as I say, are big West Ham fans, and they they never let me forget, obviously, that I, that I was a West Ham. So, I'll be honest. Normally, the games that I would go and watch Wolves every year, I normally take my boys to the Wolves West Ham games at Molyneux because of the fact that they were my two clubs, and my boys can get the experience of seeing West Ham, mm -hmm. where where the da your dad played. And I get the experience of seeing Wolves too. So I always go to Wolves West Ham at Monia Town, get that game every year. But yeah. and obviously there's a the crossover too with the manager having been at Wolves previously. So um, but no, I, I have a real soft spot for West Ham. They, they gave me uh, an opportunity to live a boyhood dream. And you know, you, you get those attachments and you never ever lose those. And as I say, I always <laughs> I'll always have a big, big soft spot for West Ham. And I do always you see 
they're my second team. If you can have a second team in the Premier League, as I say, but I, when I was young, I was a Wolves supporter, so I'm never going to be. I was a big Steve Ball yeah. fan, so I'm not going to. I'm not going to jump ship, you know. Yeah, no, I, I, I get that, and I think you know I've spoken to a lot of ex West Ham players, and they still love West Ham. I think you know they may not have been West Ham fans when they came into the club, but certainly yeah. when they left it, you know West Ham is in their DNA now. And oh, big team, big team. It's, it's a proper testament, West. It's testament I, to the I, club, isn't it? West Ham are, pro- as I'm saying, I'm mm-hmm. saying, you know, they're a proper football club. They're a proper yeah. working class, as Wolves are. They're a proper working class football yeah. club. And, be- and because of that, and the- what they've achieved over the years, even though they haven't won trophies left, right and centre, the fans still love the fact that the club is steeped in history and have had Bobby Moore and players like that of that calibre, serious footballers. You know, and as the old joke was, England won the World, World Cup, obviously, because because a couple of teams, the players are from West Ham. Yeah. So after was the one I always used to hear from my uncles going, well, England, England won, the, won, the, won the World Cup with more West Ham players. Next team will tell you that, you know. So. That's what I say. You know, England needs to have at least three players in their starting line yeah. if they want to win something. We yeah. all say it. We all say it. Yeah. You know, we really do. But um, a um, couple of other questions I've got for you just before we go off here, Graham. Yeah. Right? Firstly, West Ham, how do you think we're going to do this season based on, you know, your knowledge of how... I guess, how we play, the new manager, you know, the team players that we've got. I mean, what's, what's your expectations for the season for West Ham? I think it's been a slow start, but I think it's very early days to, to be judging mm. Lepetegui. Um, I think I think he's brought he's brought some good signings. I know Max Tillman firsthand, obviously, mm. came from us. Really yeah. talented player. Uh, obviously, kind of brilliant, brilliant um, rise in football from futsal to obviously Maidenhead, to Wolves, to, the, to West Ham. Mm. I think he he'll definitely get better with age. Probably needs a wee bit of experience in beside him, um, because he had that he had that at Wolves. He was the better he was a better player when we had Dawson playing. He played yeah. brilliantly with Dawson, so he maybe needs a bit of experience. I think uh, Lepetegui, to be fair to him, is a is a is a proven manager. I've I've no doubt that he'll get it right. Um, and obviously, changing managers as we as we're all aware aware doesn't exactly get you results. It, it takes a while for a manager to put a stamp on a club. Obviously, yeah. Moyes did. I think Moyes did fantastically well. I know mm. it wasn't everybody's cup of tea in regards to how he played, but they still achieved success. It wasn't really the West Ham way, but again, it it was part it was part of the process and getting to where they need to be. Um, mm. Obviously, the fans have tasted one of the European success now, the Euro, Europa Conference League. Um, so it whets their appetite. They want somebody to come in now and take them to the next level. And I think Lepetegui will play football. I think he'll play football. There maybe mm. hasn't been much of that to date. But I think we'll be confidently upper half. I can't see West Ham with with the caliber of player that brought in. I think it's been a very good window, and I think it just takes it's, it's same as same back here with the team I'm involved with. Um, it takes a while for the players you bring in the bed. You know, they don't, you don't, they don't bed in straight away. It, it takes them a while to get used to the way the team plays, get used yeah. to the atmosphere. You know, but but I've no doubt, I've no doubt that the players that you've signed this year have, have been impre- impressive in my opinion, and it's only a matter of time before they start delivering. Yeah, I, I I agree with you, and I think you know, football is a fickle sport, and I I feel sometimes that a lot of supporters kind of expect instant results when we sign X, Y, and Z players. But to your point, I mean, don't get me wrong, I I am I I have my frustrations, particularly at the weekend. You look at the team choice of what we played against, um, yeah, against Fulham, but. At the same time, I'm also consciously aware of the fact that it does take time, you know, for these teams to gel, to adapt to a new style of football and everything else that you said, it completely resonates with me. So your message to West Ham fans is presumably I, and it will come be good. patient. It'll take I think I'll be honest, I, I could see it taking it might take you another one, maybe two transfer windows mm. where where he'll get the caliber of player in he needs to play that level of football because when he came in initially at Wolves, the, the, we we liked what he was doing. Mm. But obviously there was there was the the owners reneged on giving them the finances to be able to bring in the players he wanted. So I, I think it might take a window or two, but I still think you'll be comfortably safe this year mid table, maybe yeah. slightly higher. Um, I know most West Ham fans would have higher aspirations, but I think if you're going to build a legacy of a of a new manager, you've got to give him the time to bring in the tools he needs to to achieve yeah. that. You know, and I, I think given time, he'll he he'll have good contacts and he'll have good. Um, he'll have good uh, targets in mind. As I say, if they can get them, say, very early in the season, um, was it five games in? If even five, four, five games in, four league yeah. games, one in the cup. Yeah, yeah, very early, very early. But I think really? I think West Ham will get it. He'll get it right. Um, yeah. and, and as I say, West Ham could, will will, will uh, move up that league fairly fairly quickly. Uh, let's hope. Let's hope. 
Last question I've got for you, Graham. Um, you've obviously gone through that process of being a young guy coming into West Ham United. There's a lot of young young players out there that have been in or are in the same situation that you found yourself in as a youngster. What kind of uh, what piece of advice would you give to these youngsters without stating the obvious in some respects? Because yeah. I know the question's asked a lot to ex pros. But what piece of advice, one single piece of nugget, would you give? To any individual in the same sort of situation that you found yourself in when you joined West Ham, um, I think the most thing is to keep your mind open and be willing to learn. Take take the advice that you're given, work hard in your training, um, um, live now in modern football. Modern football now for me is all about running, so you need to be athletic. So you obviously need to look after yourself. Foot, mm. Footballers need to look after themselves. But I think that the thing is that um, embrace embrace what you're told. And never be afraid to make mistakes because mistakes are part and parcel of football. I know people people get hepped up about particularly particularly even in young football. I know from my boys, people get hepped up in results. Football's not about results at that at young age. Football's mm -hmm. about developing as a player and yeah. developing the qualities and the skills that you you can use as you get older. You know, nobody's gonna remember we, we I scored three goals on an under eleven match. You know, mm -hmm. that's great. But developing characteristics that make you stand out. As a player, getting older is what the most important thing is. You know, enjoy your football when you're young. Yeah. Give it a hundred percent. Don't be don't be getting too high with the successes. Don't be getting too low with the failures. Stay in the middle. Stay grounded and just sort of give it your best. Yeah, no, that's 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 great advice. That really is. Um, like Grad, it's 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 been a real pleasure. You know, having this conversation with you. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, Want to speak to you again because again like i said earlier i know you've got tons of stories that you could share um maybe we'll do this again right but honestly it's been it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much um so yeah um look if you've liked this channel if you've liked this uh this this show please do click on the like button and subscribe as i said earlier on it really really does help and we appreciate it we want to produce more content like this by speaking with some really interesting guests like graham um, so thank you again, Graham. Have a great evening. And um, yeah, we'll see you soon. Bye, Bahamas. Peace.